And since this is Colossians class, why don't you turn to the book of Colossians? Yeah. I knew I'd throw, throw a curve at you just right off the bat. <laughs> All right, chapter 1. And uh, let's go ahead and read uh, verse, starting with verse 13. <clears throat> we'll read 13 through 19. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Um, <clears throat> you know, to me, I, I can't help reading this and see maybe a contrast of how some people read it these verses are all meant to point out him, <clears throat> not just a bunch of loose little subjects along the way. For example, uh, the verse 13 begins with who hath, it's him who has delivered us. Uh, verse 14, in whom we have. The very thing we go, redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins, we would go, we have, you know, this. But it's who, and everything after that, just, again, him, 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 him. It's pointing out him and trying to bring forth the, <clears throat> the reality of him. Um, I'd like to read another translation, which you probably don't have, starting with verse 16. <clears throat> so if you would listen carefully, I will read this translation for you. He is what God had in mind all along. All other things in heaven or earth, seen and unseen, no matter if it was thrones or dominions, kings or authorities, all were made as a vague representation and only existed because of him and for him and all points to him. God's concept of him being all existed before all things and without them representing him would all fly apart for lack of any real meaning. The word consist is the word hold together. By him all things consist. <clears throat> So I'll read that last part. And without them representing him, would all fly apart for lack of any real meaning. Also, and besides temporal representations, he is the head of the church, that which specifically functions as his body and vehicle. With them, he is the beginning of everything. He is the firstborn that represents the whole that does not include the dead whom he left behind, so that in any consideration he is the starting point and the preeminence of it. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that all his personal divine fullness, including his nature, power, and attributes would inhabit Christ, the risen man. <clears throat> all right, let's see, I probably should have wrestled with beasts in Ephesus before I got here at least with this microphone, and cord, and draw you a little picture.
I'm going to have to fatten this circle here. Start feeding you, Lord. All right, <clears throat> for those who may be listening and not have a, a video, what I drew on the board was uh, three circles. The first one um, says Son of God, and beside it is an arrow pointing to another circle that says Only Begotten Son without the N. makes him sound like he's mafia, only begotty. So, <laughs> and I, I, an arrow uh, to a cross, and then for those on Skype, uh, an arrow away from the cross pointing to another circle, and it says firstborn, and it is the firstborn son. So son of God, only begotten son, and firstborn son. This is, this is what we want to talk about. We want to, <clears throat> this is based on um, uh, an article that I did um, late 70s probably, could be very early 80s, maybe 81, I don't know, but probably 70s. And it was entitled, Jesus Was Born Again. Jesus Was Born Again. And um, needless to say, the title, you know, was very exciting for people as they, as they bought tomatoes and then went to rocks and <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> whips, chains, and then daggers. Anyway, um, so I want to add something here now that you've looked at it and contemplated how right or wrong or have no clue what this is, is um, I'm going to put uh, of the only begotten son and I'm going to put of the firstborn born also. Only begotten son born underneath it, firstborn born under it. All right, so let's start with the Son of God. When we're talking about the Son of God, we're talking about the eternal Son of God. He was never birthed. He's eternal, without beginning and without end. Amen? Okay. But <clears throat> he didn't stay that way because God had a plan. And that plan, we have to understand, is not some sort of a... A, a written out plan that they all agreed on that said we're we're going to create a world we're going to create a universe and then on one little planet we're going to put people and then those people that are on the planet um, not long after we made them we're going to let the devil sneak into the garden where they live And we're going to make them, we're going to have them disobey what we said. And then they will be under the control of the devil, the serpent. And then, Jesus, how about you go down there? Yeah. And you, you go die for them. And then all of the people will come running to you and go, thank you, thank you. Thank you for saving us. And then they'll look at the plan on the board and they'll all go, now that's genius. <laughs> <laughs> what a great plan. And this is why we're God. And they're not. Because this is so good. It's so unusual. I know they'll all love it. <laughs> all right. Well, no. That's not, that wasn't 
what the plan was. If you really want to know what the plan is, you're looking at a chart of it right up here. It all pertains to his son, and it pertains to a progression of his son that will influence us as we pr progress in the knowledge of him. So starting with the son from before the foundation of the world in eternity past, he was always the son of God. There was no other son of God around. Okay, so in that plan, he would become incarnated. And when he came down, so now we're talking about not the first circle, but the middle one. He came down, and when he did, um, he became the only begotten son. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay this out a little bit, and then I'm going to read the, the thing, the little article that I wrote on this. And he became the only I want you to notice the word only, the only begotten son of the father. The only. Okay. Now, I want to point out something that may be difficult, it may not be, <clears throat> but to become the only would mean that he's contrasting himself to the thought that there might be more or there's not, he's the only. Okay, so he's saying... Uh, now that he's down here, he's not just saying, I'm the son of God or I'm the son. He's saying, I'm the only begotten. Through birth, I have become the only begotten in incarnation down here. There is none other like me. And the example that I find best to use, because this is going to, the scripture will explain this, John 12, 24. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. So we're going to type the only begotten son, because he was at that time the only one, the only one of his kind, the only one like the father, as a corn of wheat. And we're going to say, because... I believe this is what was going on when, when he, the, those scriptures are there, was that, that the only begotten son said, I am the only seed like this. All of you are bad. <laughs> I'm good. No, no, he didn't. It wasn't good and evil. That was the wrong truth. It was life. It was another life, okay? And was another kind of life. And we, in our fallen state, were um, contrary to God in spirit, in nature, in attitudes. And so Jesus looks around and he has, he has walked the earth for three and a half years in ministry. And as he has done that, he has um, healed people, he's blessed people, he's, he's fed people, he's done all of these great things. He's done, you know, he's raised the dead. He's done all of these things, which, of course, we as Gentiles, or those who are, <laughs> would say, um, this is the new covenant. Jesus came and he healed and he raised the dead and he fed and da 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 not realizing that the Jews were used to that and their whole history is full of that, God raining manna down and raising the dead and all kind of stuff, and that that was not anything new to them. So if you said to them, this is the new covenant, they would go, what's new about it? Hello. So, so he, noted, uh, he knows that he is the only. He's the only at this stage. And he says, I'm going to abide alone of this kind if I don't fall into the ground and die. Okay? And then, what's the word? Much fruit. Much, much, much. Okay. So that starts bringing in the reality of the firstborn. You're familiar with many different terms. The firstborn of many brethren. You ever heard that one before? The firstborn from the dead. Um, and 
so, and one of the things we're going to do tonight in introducing this is that hopefully next week I'll be able to present the same thing in a greater light of what this all really leads to instead of just the facts of it. Okay. So, as such, and here's, here's part of my point, as the only begotten, he has done all of this stuff even so that people could say, well, you're the son of God, or you're of God, or whatever, but nobody is inwardly changed regardless of what has happened. Nothing eternal has happened that, that has changed everything forever. Lazarus was raised from the dead. What do you think happened to Lazarus eventually? He died and he didn't get back up. Amen? He died and he didn't get back up. It was, that was it. Um, so there's all these, you know, there's, and can you ma imagine, would it be possible that many of the people he healed might have died from something else? Because they all died. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they all died. Okay, so, you know. But Jesus says, Jesus sees what the real issue, the real life-changing issue is. Not healing, not blessing, not teaching, because he taught them pretty well, didn't he? He taught them good. <laughs> he did, you know, wonderfully, and yet um, he could say uh, to the people, he'd say, when your enemy slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek, right? And they would go, yes, amen. You know, I mean, the, the Sermon on the Mount, all of them down there listening go, oh, that's really good. Never heard anything like that before. Well, and then they walk off and, you know, somebody bumps into them as they're leaving. Hey, you know, he slaps him, he goes, yeah, and jumps on top of him like a bear. And, tears into him or something. Um, the teaching of Jesus has no power. The life of Jesus is the power. Now, the teaching of Jesus is seeds to open our eyes and hearts to the life of Jesus. Amen? You don't have to agree. I mean, you know, you, well, you don't. You know, it's like, you know, sound, it, Pretty much everything I've shared so far sounds crazy, so you don't have to agree with anything. You're not going to hear a lot of people talking about this like this, but it's but it's a fact, and that's you know uh, that whole thing of of uh, John 12:24 and Jesus saying that it says that the Greeks went seeking for Jesus, and they came to the disciples and said, "Sir, we would see Jesus. We want to see Jesus." And the disciples went to Jesus and said, "Jesus." There's people from other nations finally coming. This thing is catching momentum. We're moving now. And Jesus, and it says Jesus answered. This is his answer to they want to see him. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It'll abide alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. What is he saying? He's saying if you really want to see me, you need to see me at the cross. You need to understand that everything that's gone before, I mean, you know, uh, you know, and when I say stuff like this, I'm not trying to disparage anything. I'm, I'm trying to lift Jesus above it. I'm trying to show a contrast so we can go, you know, okay, I choose Jesus, you know what I mean? But you have to, sometimes you have to do that, that with a contrast. I mean, in the early days, I was, I was involved in the charismatic movement, and God was doing miracles, and wonderful things and healings and things were just going on left and right, you know, and, and I remember, you know, I remember a bunch of ministries that started by God healing somebody or doing something incredible for them, and they got up, and they, that's what they preached from then on, what God did for me. That was their emphasis. Okay, well, that's better than saying, you know, I love Satan or something. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. But that's not the goal. The goal is him. 
The goal is that we be conformed to that image, conformed to the image of the firstborn. And that we, um, uh, that, that he can do miracles, he can do whatever he wants to do. He can do whatever, and, and I really, I'm for that. Um, I can even believe that he could do some things that most people go, you know, was, was that really God? Well, I don't believe that, but I believe God can do anything he wants to. You see the difference? I don't know if I believe that, but I believe God can do anything he wants to. Therefore, if he wants to do that, he can do that. I'm not going to argue with that. But that's not the Jesus I am seeking to know. You know, that he can fall on a congregation and everyone will bark like a dog. I'm really not after that. Okay? But that's fine. If y'all go for it, but, you know, your, your compass is off if you're going for it. You know? I mean... My fear would be, you know, somebody would stand up in the service and read the dog is turned back to his vomit, you know, and the big tooth. Anyway, I, but anyway, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I plead innocent on knowing whatever's going on with that stuff. But, <clears throat> so, so Jesus, that's, by the way, that's in John 12, and he's come to the last portion of his life, the last week, I think, or whatever. And, and it's almost like I saw him turn back and look at his three and a half years of ministry, and he just goes, Greeks, I don't know why you're here, but to be here for whatever along the way is wrong, because you still won't know me as a seed that must fall in the ground and die that the plan is not the only begotten son. Okay, can we use another term for the only begotten son? Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> right? You know, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, how many people do you know that are Christians put their emphasis on trying to be like Jesus of Nazareth? Okay. You know, well, we, we got to do miracles, or we got to do that, or we got to feed the poor, we got to do this, and you know. Uh, and it's all looking at Jesus of Nazareth. They've never seen the nature of God, which is one of the beautiful things of the scriptures that we're going to get into, which we've actually just read when we began. They've never seen the nature of God, they've only seen as it were, the hands of God. They'd never looked into his face and been changed into that same image from glory to glory. They have only looked at the face of a Nazarene. It, yes, and it's the, it is the only begotten son, but that, that son needs to fall into the ground and die. Well, that's hard for people. And I understand how hard that is because it was hard for me when I began to see it. <laughs> it was difficult. But... But that's what has to happen. That Jesus has to go away. What did Jesus say? I have to go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So you start you start being drawn into something if you listen if you're listening to him and if you're listening in in, in his last things that he's sharing. I mean, the true vine thing was some, one of his last sharings also. I am the true vine, you are the branches. And, and he's talking about a relationship with Jesus that you couldn't have with Jesus of Nazareth. You couldn't be a branch to him, you know. It, you'd look real weird. Jesus of Nazareth walking around with branches sticking out of him. You are the branch of the one who died and rose again. That's where the life flow is. And he's not trying to teach you to be an independent, only seed that blesses people, but nobody ever gets changed by your ministry. <laughs> because Jesus is the change. Because Jesus is the change. All right. So, 
I am going to go ahead and read this crazy thing. Jesus was born again. I, I started it very sweetly. Did you know that Jesus was born again? <laughs> and they're all going, no, I didn't. <laughs> and, you know, you're going to the loony bin for loony Christians. Okay. <clears throat> that might be a pretty strange statement, but the scriptures can shed some light on this. Before the creation of the earth, there was the Son of God who was daily the Father's delight. So we're about to talk about the first circle here, the Son of God, okay? Before earth, before, before earth, before birth. All right. I'm reading from uh, Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 20, starting with verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his world works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was when there was no depths. I was brought forth when there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, as I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, he, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, um, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. All right, so he has made this absolutely clear that this was before all the earth and all that, right? Okay. But who was this son of God? We know him in, in human flesh form called the only begotten, but who was who was he? Well, this scripture begins to describe him as what? He's the firstborn, the beginning. Remember what we read in Colossians? All da 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 da. He, that's what he is in the Father's heart because the Father's heart is what counts, not the manifestation of it. The manif if it's real, it'll manifest, right? If it's not real, then we're just faking it. But if it's real, it'll manifest, and that what is, is the son of the father's heart. But as yet, because he kept saying stuff like that, as yet, right now he's just the son of the father's delight. But the delight is more tied to who he really is and the manifestation of that nature over here. All right. Now, in truth, now, let's just say, let's just also point this out. In truth, that spirit and that way was manifested over and over in Jesus of Nazareth. It was, but not to the point of death, not to the point of selflessness, to the degree of God becoming man and man becoming a servant and a servant becoming a criminal and a criminal becoming crucified and considered vile by everybody. That's a pretty deep manifestation of the extreme selflessness of God. But you did see that regularly in his walk, but they were minor manifestations. And not only that, but none of them fell into the ground and died. Amen? All right. So, the son described in these scriptures was not a created being. What was that? Was the son described in these scriptures was not a created being, neither was he the result of a birth. All right. For he had always existed. So notice I put born um, under the second and third circle, under the only begotten and the firstborn. But uh, I could have written birth, but I put born because you need to see he was born in a manger so that if something else happens, he dies and comes back, he's actually born again. Okay? So this is, I'm baiting you. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so the, the Son of God, before the foundation of the world, had never experienced a birth. He was the Father's delight and was later to become the Father's prototype. Now that's a word, prototokos, that is used in Colossians, and we'll be dealing with that more. But he became the Father's prototype. See, if, if before creation and before the thought of creation, um, uh, God wanted, to, wanted something, he would in his heart begin with a prototype. And everything else would have to be fashioned after that prototype. Just planting seeds. We're, we're going to have a lot of time on this in the next couple of weeks. Um, God delighted so much in his son that he desired to have more of him. So there, there in eternity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit conceived the plan for many sons to be added to the family. In order to carry out the plan, Jesus was born of a woman, made under the law. This is Galatians 4.4. 4. And his first birth took place in a manger in Bethlehem. So I think we're all okay with Mr. Only Begotten, aren't we? <laughs> he was born in a manger. Um, and so that could be called what? His first birth. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right on, Lindsay. <clears throat> all right. At this birth, he was called the only begotten son. The only begotten carried on 33 and a half years of life on this earth, and just as in eternity, he was the delight of the Father, and even stated, I do always those things that please my Father. That's John 8, 29. <clears throat> All right. So um, you see, uh, especially in the Gospel of John, you really see this relationship of Jesus' heart, whether he's the Son of God and the and you know, they're delighting in one another to he's the, the only begotten, his heart and relationship. See, he never, when he was getting ready to leave, he didn't say, well, I'm going to die. Or he didn't, in that sense, he didn't, here's the big one. He didn't say, I'm going to go to heaven. He said, I go to my father. Because that was eternal. I mean, I'm assuming heaven was, I mean, the way Genesis one and so on there, God created the heavens and the earth, that was created. He's not going to something created. He's going to like kind. He may be wanting to get out of here to find something else like him. After his kind. You see that? All right. So, um, The Father also bore witness by declaring from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son. And I've always, you know, I've always thought the only time the heavens open and God is seen and he speaks, he speaks of only one thing. You know, I was, when I was in Bible school, of course, you've got to remember I was early 20s and somebody, they were talking about, well, you know, if you died and went to heaven, what's the first thing you'd want to do when you got there? I said, or what's the first thing you'd want to ask the Lord? That's what it was. You remember that when that happened? What's the, what's the first thing you'd want to ask Jesus? And they're all being real spiritual. I said, I'd want to ask him if Elvis is up here. <laughs> and, uh, well, I thought it interesting. I thought it interesting that the heavens open, the first real shot of the Father, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, just, you know, there's so many things, you know, why do you guys act this way? Or what, you know, you know, what were you thinking when this happened? He goes, this is my beloved son. Okay. And remember in Colossians, when it says we were translated, we were translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's the actual translation of that all right but what's it mean to be the beloved son we've kind of hit on that in early on i think pretty much in exodus uh, we we mentioned quite a bit of it 
so I'll, but I've got this statement in here. Throughout scripture, the beloved son is the one who will become the firstborn, but through means of death. Okay. So the, to become the firstborn among many brethren requires the only begotten to go into death as a seed and come up as a tree. Go in as an individual seed and only and come up as a tree with much fruit with lots of seeds in that. Does that make sense? Okay. So, the beloved son, and um, this can be seen, I'm sure that I'll, I'll mention it many times again and again, but the beloved son is the one who is designated for death. Okay, so you say, and when I say death, I don't necessarily mean that they the actual death takes place. I'm thinking right now of um, Isaac. You know, take now thy son, thine only son, thine only, your only begotten son, the son whom thou lovest, the beloved son, and offer him on an altar. Well, that had to be real to them. They had to have the death already in them to even go up there. All right. So the, so the beloved son is always the one designated for death. And you see that again with uh, Joseph. Joseph received a coat of many colors which designated him as the beloved son, which also designates you as the firstborn. But if you don't, if you don't go into the death, the coat isn't yours. Okay, you kind of see that. Well, of course, you know, so he goes out to bless his brethren, bring him food, and they, they try to kill him. Beat him up, throwing him in a, in a big pit, in a Brad pit. Sorry. Gives me a chance to drink a little bit. And goes down into Egypt. Remember, the, you, do you remember the visions that he had? Joseph. Well, I'm not going to talk about it right now because one day I will finally make it to, uh, after Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, then we'll get into Joseph. So, yes, I, should I live to be 103, we will get to Joseph. <clears throat> Amen. All right. So, again, the scriptures, when speaking of Jesus' life on this earth, called him the only begotten son. For instance, when speaking of him being made flesh and dwelling among us, it calls him the only begotten of the Father. Um, that's uh, John 1, 14. And also in 1 John 4, 19, it speaks of the one that was sent into the world and calls him the only begotten Son. Probably the most recognizable scripture. Do you all even know what the most recognizable? Can anybody quote it? Can I hear it? His what? His only son. He gave who? His only son. That's this guy in the middle, in the middle circle that we got here. God gave him unto death. For what? So that he'd get many more sons in the image of Christ. That only happens, as it were, in the firstborn. The firstborn among many. The firstborn from the dead. The firstborn it calls him many names along that line. <clears throat> um, by the way, very nice quoting of John 3.16. And, and I am extremely pleased that you have at least one scripture memorized. <laughs> it blesses my, my widow heart. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Jesus came to fulfill the Father's plan for more sons, but he had always been the Father's only son, and even during his life on earth, he was still the only son of the Father. Does that make sense? In heaven past, in, in eternity past, he was the only son, but he wasn't called the only son because there were no other th sons thought of. You, you'd have to have a contrast of there have to be more or the concept of more or whatever but he's he was just the son of God but he becomes the only begotten because he was birthed in a 
in a in a what? A manger. In a manager. Okay. Hmm. I could use that. Um, all right. It is where Jesus is begotten again of the Father that the plan for sons is accomplished. Um, begotten again. That son has to die. Now, let, I want to, even if I don't finish this, I need to show you something or at least explain it and then you disagree with it. I mean, but I need, to, I need to explain it. And that is, we look at Jesus of Nazareth as just dying and then getting up. But he died. And he didn't come back anymore. I'll explain so you don't have to react too much yet. He died. He died. He went away and he died and a new son came forth. Okay, you say, what? <laughs> and I understand that. Okay, as, as the, in the form of a seed, now it's the same life, right? It's the same life, only begotten, firstborn, son of God from before the foundation of the world. It's the same life. But he was in seed form, and that son, like that, including all that he did and everything else, died. And he wanted to be known now as the firstborn. And he wanted, and the father wanted us to know him as the firstborn. And wanted to build a completely different relationship with him based on death and resurrection based on nature instead of carnal commandments. Book of Hebrews. And, and what we do is we don't let Jesus die. We let, we, we let him die, but the same one gets up. He, it's like, okay, the seed, you put it in the ground, and then it dies, and then you dig it up, and it's still, it's still a, the same seed. You go, well, this is really fruitful. Um, you're still one. <laughs> what about us? You know, but we want to run after Jesus. Oh, heal me, touch me, bless me. Folks, we're his hands. We're supposed to be the thing he touches others through, if anything. We're the body of Christ. But we're, we're trying to get him. Oh, would you do this for me and do that and everything? Not recognizing that it's a completely different person. We're asking for stuff that he's, if, if I could just draw a picture, he's sitting on the throne. We come into the throne of grace to find help in time of need. And all we're in there for is help with an earth existence based on a forgotten, long gone son to the father 2,000 years ago. And now the father sees us in son with the life, with the mind of Christ, with, with the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not that we're God, he is, but we're his body and it flows through us. And he sees us begging like the Jews did or anyone else did before the, his death and resurrection took place. So to them it's like the resurrection never happened. Because the resurrection happened to bring about this firstborn son which is the new man, which includes us. I got one amen. How many old me's can I get? <clears throat> um, so so the, the death is to, is to a relationship and a knowing of him in a certain way because he's saying by that death, I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to be this way. I want you as part of me. I want my life flowing through you. I want my mind in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He didn't say, go into the throne room of grace and ask his mind on the issue. Well, I went to the rescue shelter. There are two dogs I like. One was this, one was that. Can I have your mind on that? And he's going to go, you're completely separate from me. 
You're completely separate from me. You're, you don't think in oneness. You don't think in uh, uh, of the cross and the resurrection. That was like a fairy tale part, you know. In other words, to a major extent, he didn't even have to die for that other than maybe our sins, which I know is a big deal, but it's not as big as him. So we would just go, well, he, he, he laid down for a while and he got up and sent, then I came in and started running, chasing after him the same way I did before. But I'm telling you that the father wants this son, the firstborn. He's not looking for the only begotten and he's not looking for you to have a relationship with the only begotten son. And if you have, he wants you, he wants you to let Jesus go away. I must go away. So we think we're real spiritual because we're, okay, I'm going to let Jesus live in me and I'm going to do the stuff that Jesus did. Well, you're, in your mind, you're letting Jesus of Nazareth live in you. You're letting the only begotten son that had to die. If you're ever going to get to the father's heart and the father's plan, from the beginning, because that son, question mark over here, over that, that son from before the foundation of the world is, that it was always the firstborn that was his delight. Because he was going to fulfill the plan for sons, which it talks about in Hebrews. It talks about in different places, but Hebrews, um, what is it, chapter 2. So, there, you know, so it's like, how do you explain that? To most Christians. I mean, if that's true, I'm not, you know, I'm saying it's true. You don't have to believe it, but I'm saying since I believe it, how do you explain that? <laughs> how do you explain that? You, you, you know, many times it's like, oh, you're trying to take away my Jesus. And I go, yes, because, <laughs> because God took him away and killed him. <laughs> and they're going, what? That he gave his only begotten son. What do you think? It, do you, what, oh, I know what you think that is. He gave his only begotten son from heaven and he went, here's little baby Jesus. <laughs> Dear little Lord Jesus, little baby Jesus. We, <laughs> we're, you know, and we're going, he gave him. No, he Look at the scripture that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. The giving was here at the cross. He gave that son up Amen. unto death. I mean, you know, I know I'm different and I know I'm drastic. But, you know, it would be like he's, he says, Jesus, I'm taking you to the cross. Die, Jesus, die. We got to break this relationship everybody's got with you. They need to see us as we are. They need to know themselves as they are. As he is, so are you in this world. Didn't it say that somewhere? Is that a scripture? Or that, I'll just make that up. Of course it's a scripture. That you might be conformed to the image of his firstborn son. So it's like, you know, See, anybody can, can pick up the book and they go, you know, it's upside down. I hope, hope they don't do that. And they go, you know, yeah, look right here in Matthew. This is, this is my Jesus. Well, in, in spirit and nature, yes. But in the relationship he wants you to have with him, it is as one new man, one body. We say, we say, well, we're the body of Christ, you know. But that really doesn't have any bearing. A lot of times when we say that, it doesn't have any bearing on the cross and the resurrection and the firstborn that now is made up of many members. You ever heard the, the phrase, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh? What does that mean? Well, it means I'm, I'm one of his bones. And what does that mean in a practical way? Well, it means I'm covered by his flesh so he can protect me and love me deep, deep, deep within him. 
I don't know what, what the explanation is. It, it, it means Christ in you is the hope of glory. Oh, my God, I'm cheating. I'm jumping to verse 27 in Colossians, but that's where he's going. This is what he's not talking about the firstborn to go, oh, and it's just really cool. You know, he's going to go, uh, Paul's going to go, you know. Know ye not, as many as of you as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into death? Death, what death? Death of the only begotten. Like as Christ was raised from the dead, so you should walk in newness of life. He didn't say like as Christ was dead, or like Christ was raised, you're raised. Listen to your resurrection in that, that's Romans 6, 6. If I'm not mistaken, probably 6-3. Like as he was raised from the dead, so you should walk in new, newness of life. And the real translation there is new life. The resurrection is this new life. It's called Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, I know you're going to, we're Martha, you know. I know you're going to raise, raise Lazarus up one day. And Jesus is going, I am your resurrection and your life, at least at the cross. So, we, you know, it's like, well, I don't get that. It's too ethereal. I can just open the Gospels and read it, and I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable with my relationship with Jesus. And I just, I just love my Jesus of Nazareth, you know. And I go, well, well good. You know, again, he's dead. <laughs> well, you're just mean, Randy. <laughs> this is what Paul preached. <laughs> this is the gospel. This is, guess what? This is the good news. Paul said that. This is the, go the gospel I preached came by the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And he starts talking about when I was called by the grace of God, I got saved and lived happily ever after. No, he says, when I was called by the grace of God to reveal his son in me. I mean, over and over and over, you got to listen, you know, you got to read it and go, what is he saying instead of, you know, well, somehow it's still just Jesus of Nazareth. My friend, you know, we used to say that a lot in the hippie days. You know, Jesus is my best friend. And Jesus is going, I don't think so. <laughs> You're pretty bad there, buddy. <laughs> but, uh, but, okay, good grief. Time is getting away again. Let me even see where I stopped reading so I can mark it. Oh, Lord. Yes, please make a comment. <laughs> Eventually, you come to the place like, wow, he really did die, and he is gone. And so then, at that point, when you, you know, you accept it, your heart accepts it, and it bows down, wow, they're gone. Except with Jesus, the Father, that seed rose up as the firstborn. Mm. What did you say? <laughs> I'm so terrible. I I really do understand it when you people don't want to listen to me. Because <laughs> I don't want to listen to me either. Okay. I'm going to take a break. And uh, I think, Kelly, uh, do we need to make an announcement on what you're going to do? Is that, you want to do that? Gather my tools of death. <laughs> so um, instead of Micah, we are not going to have Micah tonight, but we are going to, those going to Ireland at the end of this month, we are going to meet um, and continue to prepare our hearts for what God is 
is in God's heart for Ireland. So if you're going to Ireland, please stay and let's meet in the fellowship room instead of in here. If you're not, just be blessed and um, have a wonderful evening. We won't have Micah tonight. So love y'all and thanks for your hearts. And again, we'll take about a five-minute break and those going to Ireland will meet in the fellowship room in a few minutes. Thanks.